These folks have collected a lifetime's worth of antique and vintage and they are ready to downsize. They're motivated sellers and I love helping them get things to a new collecting generation. We're going to talk about downsizing, what's hot and what's not in antiques and vintage now, and help them with all those questions and answers. So let's talk about it right now. Well, thank you all for coming. And what I'm going to talk about today, because I think it might be relevant to all of you, is what happens when you're looking at a change in life, maybe moving into a place like this or downsizing, moving in with family. What about your stuff? How many of you have a lot of stuff that you've collected over the years? That would be just about everybody. It just happens. Even people who aren't collectors end up with houses full of stuff. It just accumulates and kids grow up and leave things behind because they figure they can come back and get them and they never do. Today, a lot of us stand a chance to live to be 100 years old or more. It used to be that when parents went to a retirement home, their kids were probably in their 40s and 50s and their kids were moving out of the house and they could take all the family keepsakes and hold on to them and they had room for them and everything transitioned. Well, nowadays, I get a lot of calls from people in their 70s saying my mother is 90 and she's going into assisted living and I'm buying an RV. Could you please get rid of both of our households of stuff? And we've never had that before where we have two generations selling at the same time. What I really want to talk to you about today to help you with your decision making is what is currently hot and what is not so hot in the realm of antiques and vintage items. I hear a lot of times, oh, the young people don't want any of this stuff anymore. And it's not true. There's a new generation of antique decorators and collectors out there and they want stuff. It's just that what they want might be a little different than what you're expecting. For example, in the world of advertising, it used to be that big metal signs for Coca-Cola were up on old stores and they just sort of sat there until they rusted away. Then a show called American Pickers came on the air. They have made advertising items so super popular that the prices are through the roof and to the point where new collectors almost can't really afford to buy it. It used to be that cardboard signs like these that we have in frames now that people like to hang on the wall these used to be things that were not really very easy to sell because people wanted the big metal signs. Now some of these are actually selling, uh, this one is probably worth about $65 or $75, and this one's probably worth about the same. And it's just a sheet of paper that hung in a grocery store that they paid five cents for back in about 1950. Here's a tale of two blankets. So we've got this red and blue one here, and it's striped. This is an Afghan. We also have this one this blue and white coverlet, which of these do you think is antique? The one you have in your hand. The one I have in my hand, yes. Very good. This is from about 1870. How old do you think this one is? About two years. <laughs> it's, it's a little older than that, but not a whole lot. This is closer to 1980. Which one do you think is worth more money? The old coverlet is worth more money is what I'm hearing. Well, the old coverlet cost me $45. I sold this on the computer yesterday for $50. There's a whole generation of people who grew up with the TV show Roseanne. And Roseanne had that Afghan on that couch in every episode. And there's a whole bunch of people who were kids in the early 90s who are now the collector age. And they all want an Afghan because that's what they saw and that's what they grew up with. They don't remember coverlets. And this is part of the change we're seeing in the market. Here's another example. So we've got, um, this is literally painted on a paper bag by a street artist. This is a lovely watercolor from Hawaii. And then this third piece here is uh, painted on a board. Which of these three pieces do you personally like the best? Who likes number one? You do, very good. Who likes number two with the flowers the best? I see a few more for flowers. And who likes the wine splatter? Oh, a lot of people like that. Well, that's really interesting because you are reflecting the current taste in the market. This is considered outsider art. And what that is, is people who were not really famous as artists in their time, or they weren't in a gallery. In this case, this was a fellow named Jay Steensma from Seattle. And he was quite a character and well-known there, and he was bipolar. 
some days he'd be painting something on commission for a client and some days he'd be painting on paper bags and selling them for five dollars so he could get lunch which one of these three do you think is the most valuable that guy there you are very right. This guy is a sculptor named Harold Belays. He did all of the sculptures at the 1974 Spokane World's Fair. And because of that, and he died a few years ago, he is now very famous. So now I paid $50 for this back when nobody cared. It's now worth about a thousand. This is worth about 50 bucks. This is worth about four or 500. There's a lot of people, particularly in Florida, moved down with pieces that they brought from up north. Certain things that maybe have just always sat in your house and you never really gave them a whole lot of thought. Some of those art pieces may have escalated quite a bit in value. Now, what's hot and what's not in art? Well, if it's regional and outsider art, it's very popular. If it's priced over $10,000, there's a very strong market. If it's priced under $10,000, most of that market is pretty hard to sell. The middle of the market is not good in art right now. It's very wealthy people buying really expensive artists, or it's people who really like a particular uh, artist that's an outsider or a regional artist or somebody they've met. What is not hot right now are limited edition prints. I get calls oftentimes from people saying, I have a limited edition, and I say, well, how limited was it? And they say, well, it's one of a thousand. Well, a thousand isn't a very small edition, actually. And most limited edition art is worth less today than it sold for in 1970 or 1980. Uh, another uh, area of art we're seeing a lot of interest in now are metal sculptures. Uh, there is a company called Jure that was very popular in the 70s and 80s, uh, Curtis Jure. Jure pieces uh, are very expensive now. The wall hanging pieces can be thousands of dollars. How many of you have lots and lots of books? Yeah, I see uh, about half of you seem like you've got books. Books can be very collectible still. We have a wonderful resource in St. Pete because we have Haslam's Bookstore. They've been around for a long time. They sell antiquarian books. I've had several people I know call them and have them come out. I've had several people call me back and say, I'm so disappointed that they took so little. Here's the situation on books. If it's a signed first edition, if it has a dust jacket, if it's antiquarian, meaning, you know, over 100, 120 years old, uh, as long as it's not poetry or religious, those don't sell for a lot, but the other subjects do. Certain illustrators, if it's illustrated by Salvador Dali, there's a little book that we see from time to time. It's usually a couple dollars at an estate sale. It sells consistently for $50 because he did all the illustrations. Another example, I bought a 1947 animal farm at a thrift store for $3. I sold it for $150 the next week. It had the dust jacket. It was the first edition. If it was the second edition, I would have overpaid at $2. That's what a big difference it means. And that's why most places that are buying books are very, very selective now. So the books that are really valuable in a collection are generally a very small proportion. And that's often true in a lot of collecting areas. If you have a drawer full of costume jewelry, your signed pieces and your better pieces may be worth a whole lot of money. And then your run of the mill stuff may be worth a few dollars each. And most people, you know, let's face it, in life, we're generally buying things because we like it, because we need it in the moment. We're not buying it thinking, what will it be worth in 30 years? So 95% of stuff is pretty common. Three or 4% is fairly scarce. And just a handful of things are really, really rare. And those are where your value is. Let's take a look at some uh, childhood items. We have a very cute, little uh, whack doll from the Second World War made a composition. And we have this hairy guy here. Which one of these do you think is the more valuable? The hairy guy. The hairy guy I'm hearing. Who thinks the nurse is more valuable? I see more people saying the nurse actually. The truth is, is the nurse, she right now has a tag of $45 on her. And this guy is probably worth 60 or 70. And the reason is the generation that's collecting. These were popular in the 60s and 70s. Now there's a ton of new ones. This is the other thing to bear in mind. Not everything that looks the same is the same. If it says Russ made in China on it, it's worth under $10. But this one says Dam, D-A-M, Thomas Dam. And this was the company in Denmark that came up with these in the first place. 
And that's what the collectors want. And my point isn't that you folks have to know all of these things when you're looking through your stuff. It's just to help you be aware that there are differences. And if you're not sure, get help. If you have a pre-World War II character, like uh, something from Gasoline Alley, younger people don't really know a lot of those strips and the values on some of those things are starting to come down. Whereas if it is a Lego set from 1975 and it's got all the pieces, the prices are soaring through the roof on stuff like that because that's the generation starting to pick up. Everyone has nostalgia for their own childhood Battery operated toys from Japan, those cheap things that you had to get the batteries and they maybe ran for 10 minutes and crapped out and then the kid threw it in the garbage. That's why they're very valuable now because 99% of them went to a landfill and the ones that are left are what people that are the collecting age now remember. About the wind-ups wind are still doing pretty well. Uh, the important thing is that they work generally, but most of the wind-up toys have held up pretty well. I think anything with motion and mechanics seems like it holds its value a little more because it does something so that makes it a little more interesting uh, another example here who recognizes this guy <laughs> this is a stife tiger and i think i heard one of you folks say you had this that was you okay very good have you had it since you were a kid i, I don't know when i got it what's one it wasn't when you were a kid yeah a lot of people collected these later stife is still pretty collectible but a lot of people who were collecting these 30 years ago were paying three and four hundred dollars for this guy. Well, nowadays he's probably about half that. So collectibles go up and collectibles go down. And I always tell people, I encourage them, if you're a collector, buy it because you like it and figure the price you paid was for your price of enjoyment at the time. Uh, this is actually from my house. Does, is it worth a thousand dollars? To me, it's worth zero because I am enjoying it in my house. It's not for sale look at your collections and if they've done well and gone up in value that's great and if they've gone down don't worry about it be realistic about where things are today if it's time to let go of some of those things because you did get to enjoy them how many of you have a china pattern at home a whole lot of folks very good how many of you have a regular everyday dinner pattern and a china pattern at home i see a lot of people raising their hands how many of you have tried to sell that china pattern or get rid of it lately one person and what was your experience your daughter and your granddaughter don't want it i've actually been uh, encouraging people to take out their china sets and play with your grandkids with them have a tea party don't be afraid of them breaking a cup or saucer because what's happened over the years is a whole lot of people had wonderful china sets and they sat in the cupboard and they were only used on Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and whatever special occasions there were. I remember when my father died, same thing. My oldest sister said, I don't want the china. My younger sister said, I don't want the china. So my mom said, well, I guess you can have it. And I said, I don't want it. And she said, why don't any of you want my beautiful china? And I said, you want to know the truth? I look at your beautiful china and I think all the times that I was made to sit at the kitty table don't scratch that. If you break that, we can't get another one. You wash that by hand. You can't put it in the microwave. It has a silver rim. I'm not interested. China was made to be scary. So if you have things in China cabinets and you want your family to be interested and you want them to maybe take some of them on, get them out, play with them, talk about who they belong to, make it interesting to them make it relevant to them in some way where they'll feel a connection. How many of you have something like Franciscan Desert Rose or Apple or one of those very famous patterns? I see one person raising their hand. I love that stuff. It was bread and butter. When I first became an antique dealer, I spent $4,000 on a set of Desert Rose and I made money all day long on that. They had all the unusual pieces they'd collected for years. That same set now is worth about 800 bucks. On the other hand, how many of you maybe recognize this, maybe from a store or something, anybody? Uh, you do, okay, and uh, do, you, do you know what it's called? Botanic Garden, yes, and this is by Port Marion. This was made in the 1990s. Notice, because it was made in the 90s, it doesn't have any silver or gold paint on the end because they knew by then that people want to be able to use this in the oven and the microwave and everywhere and not have to think about it. We had an estate sale and we had a whole set of this 
And when we opened the doors, five people went and the entire cabinet, which was full of it, was completely empty in 20 minutes. If it's very high end, like Tiffany and Meissen, it will still sell. If it's middle of the market, like Lennox, Lennox is wonderful. It's really well made. It doesn't sell very well anymore, though. Let's talk briefly about clothing and accessories, because you might have a, a whole bunch of it at your house. Stylish or designer, especially around here, there's good consignment stores for it. Otherwise, we're in Florida, and clothes go for nothing in Florida. People have a bunch of old purses they never um, wear anymore that they just sort of had. Uh, for example, there's this one. This came from an estate sale. They never used it. They saved it for good, and I guess the special occasion never came. But this is from about 1950. It's Whiting and Davis. It's very shiny. It's a lot of fun, and people really like these. They sell for almost as much as these Victorian reticules, which date back to about 1900. And the reason they sell for almost as much as these much older pieces is because these are really neat to look at or to hang on the wall, but they're fragile. And a lot of people are very practical in their collecting now. They want things they can actually use. We should talk briefly about collectibles. How many of you bought collector plates when they were selling them? Several people. How many of you bought Franklin Mint items or other collectibles? And I see some of those. With those sort of things that were made to be collectible, you really, again, you have to look at the market today. Some of the Franklin Mint stuff actually sells for really good money. Almost zero collector plates sell for anything now, unfortunately, because what they did is they sold it. It was like Beanie Babies or Jim Beam bottles or Avon bottles. It's instantly collectible. Here's this thing, and now it's going to be worth more in a month or a week or two months or next year, and it's just going to keep going up and up and up. Whenever anything is pitched that way right from the very beginning, buy it if you like it. Otherwise, stay far away from it. It is not a good investment because, like they would say, I remember in the old days on the TV ads with the collector plates, they'd say it's limited to 100 firing days. Do you know how many plates they can make in 100 days in a factory? They can make enough to fill this room about 10 times over. I should talk a little bit about furniture. Here's a tale of two tables. So we have this nice traditional nesting set of three tables that stack very nicely under themselves. And then we have this funky carved thing with the brass uh, table inlay from probably 1970. What do you think is the more valuable of the two pieces of furniture here? Any guesses? You're pointing at the brass one. A lot of people are nodding their head. I would say honestly that they're probably worth about the same amount. They're probably both worth about $125 to $135 a piece. Ten years ago, this would have been worth about 30 bucks. And that's another example of where the market changes. Now the good thing with both of these is these are small. How many of you have a big china cabinet or a large dining room set? Uh, we were just talking before the show. Yes. If you have large furniture, especially if it is dark traditional furniture that came down with you from up north, it's not going to be very easy to sell. I did my downsizing early. I've been through this with enough other people. I know how this ends. I'm going to buy furniture that I can personally move myself because I'm getting older too. I don't like lifting big, huge things. I don't want to have to clean under a huge sofa. And so uh, that is the way a lot of people are thinking. And a lot of younger people are very migratory these days. And so they'll buy little pieces, but they're not going to buy something gigantic. In the kitchen, some people overlook things in the kitchen. If you have vintage appliances, things you've just been using for the last 50 years, some of those are pretty collectible now. I just sold one of those old avocado um, colored blenders for $25 the other day, and they said, oh, it's the same price as a new blender, and it has the glass thing, and I want the glass thing, and they don't make those anymore. So they were happy to pay it. It still ran great. A lot of things were made really well back then. In the silver drawer, if you have sterling silver, there is a market for sterling silver because people will buy it for the value of the silver, but also people, if they're going to polish these days, they want to feel like it's worth their while. A whole lot of silver services got sent to the scrap. And because of that, a lot of things are probably scarcer in silver than we realize. 
Uh, similar things have happened throughout history. World War II came and all sorts of metal stuff made before the Second World War got thrown in the scrap drives. So there is actually less hammered copper from the arts and crafts era than there would have been if we hadn't had that event. So there's certain things that have greater scarcity because of that. And how scarce? We don't really know because it's just gone. Silver plate is very hard to sell now. Uh, we see beautiful big tea services that sold for four and five hundred dollars new that are selling for 50 bucks. People are not entertaining that way. They're not living that way anymore. The society has changed. It used to be that the woman of the house stayed home and she had time to polish and she had time to throw a party and do these things. Now most families, both people work outside of the house, so it needs to be easy. The flip side of that is that modern stainless steel flatware by good designers like George Jensen I just appraised a set that was just, it was just four of each piece. That was all it was, but because it had that designer's name and it was stainless, it wasn't silver at all. And the appraisal value for insurance purposes was $700. Let's talk a little bit about jewelry. How many of you folks have jewelry sitting in your drawers? Most people. And how many of you have jewelry that you haven't looked at or worn in a really long time? <laughs> Most people, yes. There are certain things that are very popular now. And this is a nice example. It's got a lot of flash. It's also got a mark on the back that says it's by Weiss, which was an American company. And it dates to probably about 1950. This little one is Czechoslovakian. 1920s and 30s Czechoslovakian jewelry is very popular now. The Chinese, in addition to taking over a lot of our brand names and producing, are now developing an interest in the old stuff that was made in America because now it's one of their brands and they have familiarity with it. And that is especially true with costume jewelry. American costume jewelry, the good sign big pieces, are starting to shoot up in value again. And I asked my friend and he said, oh, I didn't know better. I just sold a whole bunch of my Shriner New York pins for $200 a piece. And now I'm seeing that some of them are selling for $1,000 on the computer. He didn't know that the market had gone back up. So it catches us by surprise too. Anything that looks like this that's actually turquoise and Navajo, if it's Navajo or Hopi made, Southwestern jewelry is off the hook right now. People are really paying up for this stuff. We had an estate sale in Tampa where the family had lived amongst the Navajo and they had a bunch of old pond jewelry, big cuffs, a buckle this big with the huge turquoise. And our average sale for these larger items was somewhere in the four to $600 each range and they had 10 pieces. Obviously fine jewelry and um, don't just throw all of dad's pins away that he had in the dresser drawer, for example, those little tacks and things. Most of them aren't worth much, but even 10 karat gold is worth enough now because the price of gold is so high that you can get something for some of those. So don't just say, oh, it's dad's old fraternal pins. Nobody wants that anymore and toss them. And that actually brings me to a thing here. I just thought it would be fun to show this mess. <laughs> this is the contents of a friend of mine's desk drawer. He's moving into assisted living and he said, Oh, I have all these little junky things in the drawer. Do you want to just pick through? And I looked at him and I said, I'll just take the whole drawer with me to a show. It's all little two and three and five and eight dollar stuff. But to the casual eye, it looks like a bunch of junk that should just be thrown away. And that's why I wanted to show you this. I've already sold a hundred dollars out of this. Little nostalgia items, ephemeral things, a pin from a concert I went to, a backstage pass for the Go-Go's in about 1983, a concert that somebody went to. This is a ticket that is for the Democratic National Convention when FDR was uh, nominated, and this is for the seventh session, and it was never used and has the original ticket stub. This is worth about 20 bucks. It was just sitting in a pile of papers in an old desk and it would have been thrown away had I not happened to be there and said, I think we should go through these together. The temptation a lot of times is, especially if the uh, lady of the house is around and the husband is not around, is to say, oh, all that junk in the garage, all that junk in the drawer, all that junk in the man cave, let's get rid of that junk. I can tell you when I started in the business 30 years ago, we would see women come in and be really excited and they'd be buying pretty porcelains and things like this. They'd look at uh, things like these Fenton baskets or 
this mice in peace here and they'd get all excited. And meanwhile, we'd see the guys standing there looking really glum, looking really bored. And it finally dawned on us that hey, we're missing out on half the customers. So we started trying to find antique dealers when I was running an antique mall who sold guy stuff, fishing lures, sporting equipment, farm junk, anything we thought would be interesting to men. And wow, our sales went up quite a bit because we had forgotten an entire half of the market. How much is the little mice? How much is the little mice? If she was in perfect shape, she would probably be in the range of 300 to $350. And that's a great price for her. She's very well done. On the other hand, Meissen, which is a big name, this piece would have sold for that same price 30 years ago. The prices really have not budged at all. Nowadays, this is probably a $250 to $300 piece. This piece of signed Seguso glass is worth around $500. When I first started in the business, this would have been $100 and this would have been $500. So that is just an example of how tastes change. What about carnival glass? Carnival glass is starting to make a comeback. Carnival glass was super popular when I started in the business. It was one of the biggest things going. We sold a red Fenton Lotus bowl for 3,500 bucks. That same bowl now sells for about 3,250. So it hasn't gone down a lot, but carnival, it really depends on the pattern. The common pieces have fallen in value a lot. The rare pieces have held their value pretty well. This is not carnival, but this is a nice opalescent piece. And this is from about 1910. And a lot of these patterns, this one was not made as carnival glass, but a lot of these patterns were what they put the iridescence on to make carnival glass. This one has iridescence on it. This is a Fenton piece from 1995. I just sold both of these on a live sale on the computer last night. Which one do you think got more money? The one from 1995 or the one from 1915? 15, I hear, and 95, I hear. Well, what's happened in the past few years, Fenton closed about 15 years ago. This was done as their 90th, one of their 90th anniversary lines. And in the last few years, Fenton all of a sudden is really popular again, especially the artist lines. So two or three years ago when I gave this talk, you would have been right. Now, because Fenton is super hot again, you are actually correct. This one sold for $65. This one sold for $35. It's more fluid than ever because, uh, like, I have a YouTube channel. A whole lot of other vintage people do, too. There's Antiques Roadshow. There's more information than there ever has been. It's easier to get information. And because of that, the trends are changing really fast. Uh, a couple years ago, they all decided that they liked these swung vases. Uh, this is an Italian one, but there's American ones like this. And they call them swung because in the American ones, they would, uh, to let it elongate, they would just hold it while it was, uh, after it was blown, they'd hold it on a tool because it's molten. And they would swing it back and forth and just let it sort of elongate and turn into whatever shape it would. I remember buying those pieces when I was first a dealer for $15 a piece and taking them to glass shows and having the people at the glass shows look at me like, what are you thinking? Those are orange. They're from the 70s. I saw one sell yesterday for $400. Uh, and so that's another example. And it's not even actually as rare or special as this piece is, but it's actually selling for more. So a lot of it is just the beauty in the eye of the beholder. Old painted furniture is great. New painted furniture that somebody slapped some paint on and scraped to make it look old, that's been done a lot. And uh, people are starting to become weary of it. Uh, so we're not seeing the prices. But if it's an old thing that's been in a barn with real old paint that's actually crackled and worn by itself, that stuff has a feeling of being real. Primitives, things that were made by hand that are one of a kind, are definitely popular now. If you have some old thing that uh, great grandpa made that's been sitting around the house, like an umbrella stand or some a wooden rack or a hall tree or something that was made, there's a lot of interest in that because people are interested in things that are one of a kind rather than mass produced. That's why we're even seeing people buying ceramic Christmas trees from the 1970s. And I can't tell you how surprised I was. My friend who I set up at Mount Dora with in November, she brought 
75 ceramic Christmas trees. She went home with four. And I remember when we would pass them by at garage sales and say, oh, junk, junk, junk. So uh, things change. Pottery, if it's whimsical, like uh, this little guy is Holt Howard from the 1950s, People love this stuff. This silly little jar, which would have been $25 when I started in the business, is now selling for $100. And that's because people really like whimsy. It seems like the new collectors coming up who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, they like happy faces. They want something that smiles at them. And they love all of this kitschy stuff that we made in the 50s that was five and dime store stuff. So the Hager sailfish is a particularly desirable piece because it's Art Deco and because we're in Florida, this is probably a $65 to $85 piece now. It didn't used to be, but times have changed and they're not in business anymore. And so now they're interesting to collectors. In the 1980s and 90s, they made a lot of big pieces. The big gazelles are selling for a lot of money. Hager in the 80s to stay in business in the 80s and 90s, I think it was really smart. They started making larger pieces and selling them through furniture stores because they realized they couldn't compete with the offshore imports for all this little stuff. So they said, well, let's make really big things that are expensive to ship. And we're already in the middle of the U.S., so we have an advantage. And they are starting to really become collectible. Uh, it's unfortunate that in the collecting arena, it seems like a company has to be dead and gone before people understand how great it was, but that's what's happened with Hager. This piece here, this is Sasha Brostoff. Uh, Sasha Brostoff died 30 years ago. There was a whole lot of hype about him when he died. A lot of people started collecting it. Now what we're starting to see is large collections amassed over the th last 30 years are starting to come out of the woodwork. When it was at its peak 30 years ago, it would have sold for about $50. Well, it's back up to about $50 now. And yet at the same time, and I still think it's a wonderful deal, this is 1840s. It's very nicely done. It's in wonderful shape. It's a syrup pitcher. I got this at the Mount Doors show this weekend for $35. This used to be a $200 piece a lot of 30 and 40 year olds who grew up in this very stripped down Ikea world saying, I'm really bored of this. I want something fancy. And they're starting to look at Victorian again. We have not had a customer for Victorian since 30 years ago. A, a great example also timepieces. This really lovely clock with the Pelicans, of course, it's probably going to be the most popular in Florida, but this is French. It's Art Deco. It's 1930s. Deco is starting to come back. The only downside to this is it's a clock. And nowadays, what she's answering is our clock. <laughs> the phone is the clock. Clocks and watches have been become harder to sell unless they're wrist watches. In Florida particularly, we have a lot of visitors from South America. South Americans love having a fancy wristwatch on. A lot of new Asian money loves having a fancy wristwatch on. So when you look at Hess Jewelers in St. Pete, for example, they are promoting the Rolex and the high-end watches all the time. You will never hear them talk about a pocket watch because the market for pocket watches, which is sad because I still have my great uncles and I'm keeping it forever because I love it, but nobody wears a pocket watch anymore. And the market for pocket watches and the prices on pocket watches has been going sideways to down for probably the last 10 years. But let me use just a few more examples and then we'll kind of wrap up and throw it open for questions. Here's a tale of two lamps. We have this chrome floor lamp and we have this brass, it's called a fairy lamp from about 1900. Now the brass lamp has been redone it used to sell for a few hundred dollars. It may still sell for a few hundred dollars. This sells for about $75. Which one do you think will sell fastest? Any guesses? The one on the left. The one on the left, he says. And I see people nodding their head. And that is actually absolutely true. The other one may be more valuable, but there's a smaller market. But there's a whole lot of people who live in modern places that like the look of that modernist lamp and that's the one that will likely sell first. So with that I will throw it open to any questions that you folks might have and I saw you first so I'll start there. LP albums. Great question, LP albums. So like I was saying earlier in most categories of collecting 
98% of what is made in a certain category is going to be common and not worth a lot of money. I get calls all the time, I have Bing Crosby records and he was really famous. That's the problem. They made millions of them. There are millions of them still around. But if you have Elvis with Sun Records before he got really, really big, anything recorded with the Sun Records label that's an Elvis if 45 starts at like 20 bucks and up. There's a few things to look for. If it says promotional copy, that means it was meant to be sent to the radio stations to be played to see if they could make it a hit. And whether it became a hit or not, the fact that it says promotional copy means that there were only a small pressing made because they went directly to the uh, radio station. If you have something that has an interesting cover, if you folks remember like back in the 60s, they would have 3D covers on albums, for example. Those are worth money because of the album cover art. Things by somebody who was not famous under one uh, as one singer and then they changed their name and became famous later. Uh, the stuff in their earlier name will typically be obscure and that'll be worth money. Things that were made offshore, like bootleg records from Japan of rock bands are worth a fortune now because they were never supposed to exist in the first place. His question was, okay, so I have a stamp collection, for example, and it was accumulated over many years, and now someone's coming in making me an offer. How do I know if it's a good offer? When I go in, if I'm buying something, I tell them right out what I think it will sell for in the market today. If I offer you $20 for something, I will say, I think it will sell for 40 to 50. I will offer you roughly 40 to 50 cents on the dollar. Makes up for my holding time and gives me a little profit, but it doesn't give you pennies on the dollar for your stuff. I think it's very wise to ask anybody who's making an offer to you, oh, well, what do you think the market is for this now? Because if they're honest, they should share that information. You can absolutely go to the computer and get some ideas about what things are selling for currently. I go to estate sales and this drives me nuts. Say they have this uh, piece of purple depression glass and they have $30 on it and they'll have a sheet underneath it that says, see, look, it's on eBay and I'll look and it'll be what someone is asking for this piece. Well, you can ask anything you want. I could ask a million dollars for this piece. Does that mean it's going to sell for a million dollars? You have to look at actual completed sales to know what the market is. If it's thinly traded and there's only one or two completed sales, then you might want to check auction records, do a Google search, see if someone else has sold it to verify. Uh, there is a, a subscription thing called WorthPoint that you can get values from if you're in the antique business. WorthPoint aggregates all sorts of auction records and they keep them for a period of time. But what they don't do is they don't vet them. So I knew an appraiser who got in a whole lot of trouble because she said, well, I did the, I did the research. It said on WorthPoint it sold for $150. Well, it was a $1,000 piece. And the reason it had sold for $150, she did not read the description. The piece that sold was damaged. And the piece that she was appraising was not damaged. But she didn't look through the research. She just said, oh, there's a number it sold. Okay, there's my number and got into a lot of trouble with the client when the client later was told by a friend of theirs, you know, you could have gotten $800 more for that thing. I don't know why they told you that. Yes? What about Royal Dalton character jugs? Royal Dalton character jugs. I just did an appraisal fair and someone brought a really nice one. I said, oh yes, these used to sell for more. Now this is worth about $125. And she said, the appraiser told me it was worth $350 and that was in 1995. And I looked at her and said, yes. In 1995, these things were selling like hotcakes and we would have gotten $350 for this one all day long. Unfortunately, Royal Dalton created a collector's club and Royal Dalton, like Hummel, like a lot of other the collectible figurines that we all liked, you would sign up for the collector's club and pay a certain amount and they would send you another one every month. And pretty soon people who joined the collector's club because they liked Royal Dalton and they had five or six of them suddenly had 30 of them and didn't know where to put another one and they killed their own market. And a whole lot of the companies in the 90s got greedy, saw that people were collecting the old stuff and started making new stuff and killed their own market. So unfortunately, Royal Dalton character jugs don't sell for a lot of money now. Yes. I have a deck of Flinch cards I picked up. I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. Oh, Flinch is a fun game. I see those a lot. No, I 
usually get 10 or 15 dollars for them they're neat looking and they're actually pretty old looking they've got a great old graphic on the box that looks like that sort of Parker Brothers, yeah, it's one of their earlier games that was a success, but they don't sell for a lot. On the other hand, I'm glad you mentioned that because I did bring a sort of obscure board game from the late 1960s called Mother's Helper. I'd never seen it before. I didn't think a lot of it. My friends who were moving to assisted living said, would you please uh, take this and sell it for us? And they also had a Raiders of the Lost Art game. And I thought, oh, that's a popular movie. I'll bet that's worth something. We got $50 for that one. This one's worth $25 to $30. So board games are another one of those things. If they've just been sitting in the closet for years, people are inclined to just say, oh, nobody wants that stuff anymore and throw them away. Beer Steins have um, not held their value as well as they should. But if you have Metlock, that's still the most popular one. It was by Villarian Bach. Uh, if they're turn of the 20th century, they still have a collector market, but the values are down by maybe a third to half, depending on the piece. If it's a 1960s era one, guys brought buckets full of them back from being stationed in Europe. Those go for very little. Original uh, boxes? Lionel trains with the original boxes still sell pretty well. Uh, they don't sell for quite as much as they used to, but they still sell for pretty good money. And some of them can be very valuable. I saw a 1931 set, the large scale in the original box that was priced at $3,500. And it's certainly worth that because it's a very, very scarce one. They were selling for even more in the past but there's still interest because they're really well done and, and people recognize them. Yadro actually is held up all right. Uh, the big pieces are selling, the big and complicated pieces of Yadro porcelain, porcelain with lots of you know boats and ships and lots of figures, they are selling for really large amounts of money still and they pretty much have kept their value. The smaller pieces are down a little bit because some of the smaller pieces they really mass produced and so they're more common. But Yadro sells better in Florida than it does in other parts of the country. I buy Yadro on the West Coast and bring it to Florida and I sell it for more here. Yes. What about cigarette and memorabilia? Funnily enough, cigarette and tobacco memorabilia are doing really well. And you would think that they wouldn't because that's something that fewer people do now. But there's a certain fascination about it with younger people. If I have a big ashtray from the 1960s, you remember those big pottery ashtrays that had room for like 20 cigarettes because everyone's having a huge party and everybody smokes? Young people are buying those, washing them out and using them as serving pieces on a table. And most of the people I sell them to don't smoke. Old tobacco tins are still very collectible, and if they're not common ones, the values have actually gone up quite a bit. What about Marlboro collectible? Well, that gets a little dicier. It was made to be collected new, and everybody held on to them. So those are a little more common, but they still do have a market. Yes? What about like, Fisher Price, the original? Fisher Price is doing well because that's something that the current collecting generation remembers growing up. And they're even buying some of the plastic stuff now. The airplane with the little people sells. I, I played with that when I was a kid. That's popular now. Uh, but the old wooden Fisher Price pieces are especially desirable. And the market has stayed pretty good for those. Uh, one thing about childhood collecting is that Kids are hard on things, so finding them in really good condition is the trick, and it's all about that. Yes? So if you have, like, something that's worth something, is it better to get rid of it now or to keep it to the market? It's like up and down, so... Markets go up and down, and that is true. Uh, I will tell you the way that my thinking has evolved on that. When I was younger, I would put stuff aside and think, well, this is going to be better in the future. This will be worth more in the future. I'm now 57 years old. I don't know how long I will be here to hold these things to wait for them to become more popular. I have kind of changed my attitude to today is today and if I'm ready to get rid of it, I'm ready to get rid of it and I will take the prevailing price today. Say it's a comic character and now they're issuing a movie about that comic character. Well, that might make a kick in the market and introduce some new people to it. So maybe the price will go up. But if it's not something I can see happening in the very near future, 
I'm not putting stuff aside on speculation anymore. If it's for sale, it's for sale now at the rate that it goes now. Movie posters can be good. It really depends more, it depends on the condition and it depends on the movie. Uh, there's something to look at with movie posters. There's usually a little number in the right corner and that little number tells you the date. And if it has a slash and another number next to it, the number after the slash is the date because it means the movie was re-released and people like the first edition the best. So those are going to be more uh, desirable. But uh, movie posters can sell anywhere from $30 to $300 depending on the movie. If you have got the piece and it had, and you broke a tiny piece off and you had it professionally repaired, how much does that cut into the value of it? If you had it professionally repaired and it's a good repair, you're probably looking at maybe a 15 to 20% devaluation because people will buy those things, but it's just not right to fool people. So if you disclose and say, oh, we had a professional restoration to this one piece, someone's gonna look at that and say, okay, well, it was done really well and I don't see it, so great, I'll buy the piece. Some people are purists and they want it to be an absolute unblemished original and that's why it's worth a little bit less. Oh yes, now Waterford, Crystal in general is not doing great. The generation between you folks and the millennials got turned off on lead crystal because there was all of this stuff about, oh, you shouldn't leave things in a decanter of lead crystal because it has lead in it. I have a friend who runs a regular shopping mall in Washington state and we were talking, she's a big antique collector, she's in her 60s and she said, I was so surprised I walked in on my 30-year-old marketing assistant and his 28-year-old assistant, and they were having a conversation about how they both have bridal registry, they both have a set of china picked out, and they both want Waterford Crystal. And I thought, wow, I haven't heard that in years. And she said, I said to them, aren't you worried about the lead? And they said, oh no, we know better. You put it in and you serve it and then you pour it out and it's just for the evening, but it's really pretty and it sounds good when you toast and we like it. So there may be a turnaround here. Um, Waterford has kept its value pretty well. Oh, that's a good one. We talked a little bit about big china cabinets and how they're hard to sell. Big bedroom sets are not so easy to sell either, and I hate to say it, but they're worth more dead than alive. And when I say that, what I mean is that we will sell the chest of drawers, we will sell the end tables, we will sell the bed, and we will sell the dresser, and we will put a separate price on all of them and let people break up the sets. We never used to do that when I first started in the business. The set was worth more together than apart. Now the sets, because beds are ho so hard to sell, it's better to break up the set and sell the pieces you can. There's two eras of brass beds. There's the ones from the late Victorian era that are really sturdy and really fancy and really beautiful and are the ones everyone was collecting. And then when those became really popular with collectors, they started making new brass beds in the 70s and 80s and they are much lighter and they tend to have a um, sort of finish on them that will speckle over time and they just don't hold up well, especially in our climate here. Brass is more popular, even little brass objects are more popular now than they've been in years and I do see brass coming in with furniture, but beds are the problem. We are bigger people than previous generations. Certain types of fashion will not fit women today. Certain types of jewelry are just too small. Like There's a lot of really wonderful bangles from the 1940s that fit girls, but they don't fit women anymore because people were so much smaller and beds were a lot smaller. My friend, I stayed in her spare room on her little twin bed and it was just big enough for me. And I, she asked the next morning, oh, is it comfortable? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, it was my grandparents' bed. And I said, you mean both of your grandparents fit on that little bed together? People want king size and very little was made king size back then. So unless you have two that you can push together and make a king out of, not easy to sell a bed. Yes. I have the yard rose fighting stallions, the big one. Oh yes. Artist sign. Oh, very good. Does that help? Artist signatures definitely help. Conspicuous consumption really started in the 50s. We don't think of it that way, but that was about the time that people like Sasha Brostoff started signing their work and making sure that was part of the feature because my name is part of what you're buying. 
It started in the 50s. It really ramped up in the 70s. If you remember designer jeans, everyone had to have Gloria Vanderbilt's name right here. That was the ethos. And because of that, that has stayed with collecting. A signed piece is usually going to sell for more than an unsigned piece. I am a big believer in taking things and having them signed by the artist. Peter Max was in town and we had him sign a poster that we had and uh, it increased the value of the poster, but then it made me want to keep it, so I did. <laughs> yes. So you've got a collection and you ask a guy like you to come in. And yes. Okay, so the question is, if someone comes in to buy your item, what percentage of the value should you expect? And I'll tell you my feeling and then I'll tell you some other people's feelings and let you kind of decide what seems reasonable. The first thing is you mentioned a person comes in to appraise. If I go into a house as an appraiser and I'm hired to appraise an item and then they say, gee, we want to sell some of these items. The first thing I do is take a step back and say, OK, I can either do the appraisal or I can make you an offer to buy and I'll tell you what I think the value is but I cannot do both of those things at the same time. It is not right for someone to go in and do an appraisal on a bunch of stuff and then say, oh, but I'll buy it from you for this. It's, it's a conflict of interest. And so if someone comes in to do an appraisal, usually that's because I'm gonna move the things and I need it for insurance, or I'm planning my estate and I need to know for my family to distribute things. If you're hiring them for that purpose, don't hire them and then let them buy the stuff. But if you're just saying, Come on in, I have some things that I'm interested in selling. I'm going to tell you what I will offer for these things, and I'm going to tell you what I think they're worth. If it's an unusual item, I will pay half on the dollar, sometimes a little bit more if it's really unusual, or I know I have a customer and can move it quickly. If it's a common item, I'm probably going to pay a third. Here's what's changed in the antique industry. When I started 30 years ago, and your much larger generation was our customer, we would sell things in a three to six month time frame. Those same items now might take 12 to 18 months to sell. And because of that, the holding cost has gotten higher. I know one very well-regarded antique maven who writes for a bunch of papers, he's on the board of Worth Point, and he says, if it's common, I'm paying 10 cents on the dollar because I can get those things all day long. And he's in Pennsylvania, and that's probably true. If it's coins, they should pay about 80 cents on the dollar. Yes. What about Cafe Delante or Kaiser? Uh, Kaiser seems like it's actually doing fairly well. I think Kaiser is something that people didn't really collect. Kaiser is a porcelain from Germany. I think people didn't collect those as seriously until later in the 1900s, the second half of the century. And for some reason, because of that, it seems like it's newer in people's awareness and the market has stayed about where it was. Capo de Monte is down. The style is very specific. The other thing with Capo de Monte is a lot of it, especially a lot made in the 20th century, has giant flowers on it and they break if you look at them funny. And it's very hard to find a piece that doesn't have damage. Yes. Lalique is also popular again. Lalique and Waterford of all of the crystal have probably maintained their value the best. Uh, partly because they just have the biggest names and the biggest reputation. Now, Lalique doesn't sell on the secondary market for what it sells for new at the Lalique store, but that's because the, the Lalique store is on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, and they know who's coming in there. So uh, you wouldn't expect those prices, but it does have a good resale market. I think embroidery is so sweet. I'm starting to see some younger people who are appreciating it but it's really gone downhill as far as values over the last 20 years because it's another thing that's a fussy thing. People are not fussing as much these days. They don't like to iron, they don't like to polish, they don't want anything that is hard to take care of. And linens, they wrinkle, they get dirty. That's become a lost art. There's very few people who will sit and embroider a towel anymore. That used to be entertainment. It used to be what we did during the depression because we didn't have any money. It used to be what we did when we wanted to give a gift to somebody. There's very few people doing embroidery now. So I actually think it's a great thing to collect. And some linen is doing really well. 1950s linens with an artist's signature, again, conspicuous consumption, like a Tamis Keefe, or even the Vera, like Vera linens for the table that have, if it's the older Vera, it has the little ladybug on it. If it has the ladybug on it, I can sell almost any piece I get. So there is interest in some linens, but a lot of the nice handmade things are selling for under $5 a piece. Do you 
Doilies are kind of like the embroidered linens. You get into where you're looking at 19th century and there's tatting and there's fine work and those sorts of things. You know, then some of those linens can be still very valuable, but most were done in the 20th century that we see. Quilts are an exception. Quilts are fantastic right now. People love old quilts and pay good money for those. Yes? Francoma I have liked Francoma for a long time. The dinnerware is pretty flat, but the vases and the wall plaques and the figural pieces, they do a mug every time there's a presidential inauguration and they send 500 of them to the inaugural ball. Well, in 2000, it was the Bush versus Gore election and no one was really sure who was gonna be the president. So Francoma, because they had to have them in time for the inaugural ball, made 500 that said Gore Lieberman and 500 that said Bush Cheney. Well, Bush Cheney ended up being president. And so they made lots more Bush Cheneys to sell. The Gore Liebermans ended up in their factory outlet store and they dumped them. They're worth about 300 a piece now. So what does this all mean to your collections? And what do we do now? My advice is to look at your collections with an eye to what you really, really love. Keep the things that are really meaningful to you or that you think you have a good spot for. Uh, there's a lot of organizers, for example, who help people with moves. So if you're in a quandary, like I heard someone saying, we moved from 3,100 square feet to 1,000 square feet. A professional organizer sometimes is worth the hire because they will help you with the packing, the sorting, the decision making, and the moving. So if you're stuck, that may be an avenue for you. You know, have it out where you can use it and enjoy it. And if there's a bunch of stuff you're not using and enjoying anymore, offer it to family. Maybe you have a friend who always said, I just love that thing. If you ever decide to get rid of it, well, now's your chance. If uh, there are still pieces left over, that is the point. Like I know you talked about having a storage locker and what do we do? That's the point where you probably need to talk to a qualified auctioneer or a consignment store. If it's an antique mall, they typically can't help you because they rent space out to dealers. So call the owner occupied stores where there's an owner you can talk to who can come look at your stuff. There's also the option of using an estate sale service like what I do or a consignment service. Be realistic about the fact that you're ready to part with this. For example, I have a whole bunch of stuff that was offered to me on consignment and it was wonderful European porcelain. And I said, well, the market hasn't really changed in 30 years. And she said, well, that's great as long as I can get what I could have gotten 30 years ago. And I said, well, yeah, but then you're paying me a commission. Oh, well, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I don't want to lose money. And I said, I don't really know what to do for you unless you sell it yourself. So, you know, be realistic about what you have the wherewithal to do. If you love the computer and you like doing eBay and all this stuff, it could be a great fun time for you to sell these things. If you have a whole house full or a whole storage locker full and you're like, I just need to do something about this, it's okay to call a professional because that's what they're for. If some of your stuff falls into the what's not hot category and people say we're just not interested and you can't find a buyer, it's okay to donate to a charity. And if you donate quite a lot, it might be worth having an appraiser just make a list or take pictures or something because nowadays the IRS will only let you take $500 off of your taxes for donation unless you have a list signed by an appraiser saying here's the values. They want someone who holds themselves out as an appraiser to have done that for you. And if you're donating a lot, it may be worth it to pay the appraiser's time in order to get that deduction for your taxes especially if you're selling a house or something where you might have a big capital gains, this may be an opportunity for you to offset some of that. There are places for things to go. Uh, please don't throw them in the landfill. Somebody out there loves your stuff and would love to have it. Anything Walt Disney Productions, if it says WDP or Walt Disney Productions, specifically PROD or Productions written out, is before about 1984 and anything that says Walt Disney Productions is potentially collectible. Videos? The videos, you know, there was a lot of hype about the videos a few years ago and I have to say I think it was a little overblown. It came and went really quickly. Everybody got this idea that, oh, VHS tapes, VHS tapes because it's never been opened. Well, there's a 
tiny handful of VHS tapes that are really, really scarce, where that's the only way the movie was done. Most Disney movies have been released on every format imaginable, multiple so times. multiple times. Is that only the people that like it? Coca-Cola stuff does great if it's vintage, but Coca-Cola starting in the 70s and especially in the 80s and 90s made a jillion fantasy items. We just did an estate sale in Seattle and it was a hoarder house uh, that I was involved in in November, I think. And they had stacks and stacks and stacks of 1980s and 90s Coke collectibles. And we sold it for three days. And at the end, we had a dealer come and they paid us practically nothing and carted the rest of it off because there's just too much of it out there. But it was very interesting. Oh, good. I'm glad. I, I like to bring props because I figure not everyone is in the same boat when they come to something like this. So I figure if I can at least make it fun to look at. It was a collector's item in her generation was Roseville. Yes. And Roseville is starting to make a comeback. It was very popular 30 years ago. The prices got way ahead of themselves. Then they fell back, and now I'm seeing at today's prices, which are about the same prices they were about when I started in the business 30 years ago, they're selling again. I just sold two pieces last night, the Fox Glove on the Shell and the Cosmo Space, and I think they went for $55 or $60 each. Now, they used to go for about $95 each, but they also used to go for a couple bucks each. So, you know, things go up and down. I remember when I was a kid in the late 70s, we went to the Salvation Army, and it was full of Roseville. Nobody cared back then. And I didn't know what it was, or I would have bought every piece. If it has no value to me, then it doesn't matter, you know. I honestly think that's the right way to look at these things because you've had your fun with it, you've had your time with it, and if it's not benefiting you now, let someone else have fun with it. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also, click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com, for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.